So good morning, everyone. Good morning. This has been a tough one to put together, but I'm really happy um, with what I finally came up with, and I think we're going to have a great morning, um, especially after that wonderful contemplative morning prayer that, that really formed us as a community and took us deeper. The hyacinth is a key symbol in Janet Stewart's religious biography. So I chose to begin with Brian Bell's stained glass image here at Atherton, and with a stunning verse written by Mushli Undin Sadi, a major 13th century Persian poet. If of thy mortal goods thou art bereft, and of thy slender store two loaves alone to thee are left, sell one, and with the dole, buy hyacinths to feed thy soul. What a wonderful beginning in a week when we are going to hear so much and, and receive so much nourishment for our minds and our spirits and our souls. It's my pleasure to launch this conference by introducing you to Janet Erskine Stewart, religious of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, gifted leader, brilliant educator, outstanding spiritual guide, a woman once called by the Jesuit who guided her into the Catholic Church and to the Society of the Sacred Heart, the most complete human being I have ever met. By any criterion imaginable, she was a remarkable woman and worthy of our study and dialogue these days. I gave the conference organizers an impossibly complicated title for my presentation. Who do you say that I am? Glimpses of Janet Erskine Stewart, mostly through the eyes of others. I suspect many of you have named a talk before writing it, and then found yourself with a difficult or impossible task. I also suspect Janet Stewart would have been horrified by this convoluted title. In any case, I came to my senses, and my energies went in another direction, inspired in part by the title of a book gaining currency this summer among religious of the Sacred Heart. The book by Jose Antonio Pagola is entitled Jesus and Historical Approximation. Pagola's book suggested to me a simpler way to describe where we are heading this morning. I'll address the basic historical facts of Janet Stewart's life. Significant dates, places, family background, religious awakening, conversion and vocation, society responsibilities, and so on. These facts can become a skeleton for all of us as we continue our study and conversation about Janet's life and work, and all of it in anticipation of the centenary of her death. Along the way, and also in conclusion, I will move beyond facts to truths, at least as I have named them, hoping in this distinction between facts and truths to nudge you to think a little about method. Here are the bare bones of Janet Erskine Stewart's life story. She was born on November 11, 1857. She converted to Roman Catholicism at the age of 22. And three years later, she asked to be admitted as a candidate to the Society of the Sacred Heart. She made her final profession in February 1889. And almost immediately, served in a variety of leadership positions. She was elected sixth superior general of the society in 1911 on the death of Mabel Digby and died three years later in 1914. She was not yet 57 years old. I think it's important. Queen Victoria reigned over the British Empire for nearly 64 years from 1837 to 1901, including the first 44 years of Janet's life. Victoria's reign was marked by a steady growth of national wealth 
and the expansion of the empire. Britain held the unchallenged position of world economic and political leadership. The English way of life was considered by many who enjoyed it as that superior to other nations and races. And this attitude lay behind the paternalism adopted toward the peoples of the empire and the desire to bestow the benefits of English rule on so-called uncivilized nations. They were about nation building as we have been. In this light, we may pardon Janet's cultural insensitivity and her prejudice during her earliest worldwide travels. She was, for example, astonished that religious of the Sacred Heart in Latin America drank beer and wine between meals. <laughs> More seriously, she could be highly critical of the caliber of religious she encountered in her travels. In one place, describing them as, quote, dreadful people who would cause problems for years to come. <laughs> Mary Quinlan's biography provides a corrective. She says, once one seems to glimpse a misunderstanding among people who were too far apart in their thinking and attitudes to be able to comprehend one another. Happily, as Janet's world later expanded, her attitudes were greatly modified. These rules of Victorian etiquette, etiquette describe Janet Stewart's comportment to a T. Learn to govern yourself and to be gentle and patient. Never speak or act in anger. Remember that valuable as is the gift of speech, silence is more valuable. Learn to speak in a gentle tone of voice. Learn to say kind and pleasant things when opportunity offers. Do not neglect little things if they can affect the comfort of others. Learn to deny yourself and prefer others. Janet Stewart was born in Cotsmoor, a village of less than four square miles in the county of Rutland in the region of East Midlands, 87 miles north-northwest of London. The red dot here in this little square at the bottom shows the relationship of Rutland, the smallest county in the British Isles, to the rest of um, the continent. And also the cutout is of uh, the village of Rutland. Rutland is the smallest county in England the surface is diversified by gently rising hills and fine valleys, watered by a variety of streams. The soil is loamy and fertile. The chief crops are wheat and barley. Great attention is paid to rearing choice breeds of cattle and sheep. I wrote that and then I sounded like a chamber of commerce. <laughs> Perhaps today it is most famous for the annual Cotsmoor hunt begun in 1740. Janet Stewart rode out on the hunt and was fearless on horseback. She once wrote to a cousin, oh, the thrilling breathlessness of seeing the flash of four shining hoofs over one's head as one extricates oneself from a muddy ditch. <laughs> this is a picture of Stewart Hall where Janet's father grew up. Here's another view of the house the family seat of Stuart Hall in Northern Ireland. As a child, Janet would often have visited Stuart Hall, her father's childhood home. These are pictures of Janet's paternal grandparents. Jemima Robeson married Robert Stuart, her looking quite dapper in his Regency jacket. <laughs> Janet's father was their fourth son. Alas, there is no good picture of Janet Stewart's father. <laughs> the Reverend Honorable Godfrey Stewart, Honorable Canon of Peterborough, Rector of Cotsmoor, and the fourth son of the second Earl of Castle Stewart. <laughs> Canon Stewart married twice. <coughs> Catherine Wingfield, his first wife, bore seven children. She died after 10 years of marriage. There may have been a connection. <laughs> Four years later, in 1849, Canon Stewart married again. This is a picture of his second wife, Mary Penelope Noel, 
daughter of the neighboring rector, Canon Leland Noel of Exton. Mary Penelope was quite literally the girl next door. They had six children, of which Janet was the youngest. This is the rectory where Canon Stewart raised his family, cared for his Anglican flock, and cultivated the 90 acres of land which he farmed. When Janet was born in 1857, four of her siblings, of the 13 altogether, had already died. Sadly, when Janet was 14 months old, her mother also died. On her deathbed, her mother had committed her children to the care of Theodosia, otherwise known as Dodie, the eldest of all 13 children. Dodie embraced this mothering role and was loved greatly by all her sisters and brothers. Here is Janet, about two years old, sitting on Dodie's lap. The little girl on the right is her sister Beatrice. The child on the left is probably Douglas, but we're not positive. Janet spent her childhood roaming the woods, riding horses, studying scripture in the rectory with her father, helping him prepare his sermons, eventually teaching three Sunday school classes each week. She also taught mathematics to young men in the village. She once said of herself, I would not have minded what I taught, as long as I could catch someone and teach them something. <laughs> Canon Stewart gave her the freedom to roam where she wanted. Thus began her enchantment with the world of nature and the life of solitude, experiences she believed essential to the complete education of every child. So Janet was raised by Dodie and her older siblings, and also by a series of governesses from Switzerland and Germany. This is one of her nannies. She was also and always the apple of her father's eye. Here are two pictures of Janet, age six and age 14. Both ages of religious awakening in her. When she was about the age of six, her brother Douglas said to her, Aristotle said we must have a last end. What is your last end, Jan? She could not answer. But the question continued to haunt her until later years, when she found a satisfying answer in the Penny Catechism. God made me to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this world, and to be happy with him forever in the next. On discovery of this truth, Janet reported that an amazing peace overtook her. Canon Stewart promoted the education of his daughters every bit as much as his sons. When Janet was 14, a highly educated German Protestant governess, Fraulein Rinz von Jürger, came to care for the children. And she brought with her many books on theology which she discussed with Janet. The governess awakened Janet's interest in German thought and philosophy and caused her to stay up at night reading under the table so that she would not disturb the family. I believe Janet's education is as wide and deep as was Madeline Sophie's. Mm -hmm. Happily, as an Anglican, she was unaffected by the strictures of the First Vatican Council against rationalism, liberalism, and materialism. That council took place in her early teenage years. As a teenager, Janet connected with a part of her mother's family who had converted to Roman Catholicism, the Noels of Exton Park. She was deeply influenced by them, and much against her father's wishes, she began to explore Roman Catholicism herself. During one of her occasional visits to Exton Park, she met a woman by the name of Mrs. Ross, a woman who had a great influence on her religious life. It was Mrs. Ross who introduced Janet to the Jesuit priest, Father Peter Galway, of the church at Farm Street in London. This relationship led to an estrangement between Janet and her dad. 
Ken and Stewart sought to dissuade Janet from exploring Roman Catholicism. He even arranged for her to meet with the Prime Minister of England, William Gladstone. Why Gladstone? <laughs> Probably it could have been because he was a family friend. Or perhaps he was chosen because he had been president of the Oxford Union Debating Society. But even Gladstone could not change Janet's mind. And here, a little digression. Oxford was not all that distant from, distant from Cotsmoor, only two counties away. One of the most famous religious movements of the 19th century was centered at Oxford and was called the Oxford Movement. Brilliant and highly distinguished Anglicans, among them Edward Pusey and John Henry Newman, converted to Roman Catholicism. For people like Canon Stewart, this would have been very disturbing. Conversion was no longer unthinkable. Janet took instruction from Father Galway, and in March of 19, 1879, she was baptized at the altar of the Sacred Heart at Farm Street. The situation was deeply tragic, both for Janet and for her father, since they loved each other so deeply. They remained in touch in later life, but Janet could no longer live at the rectory, which had been her only home. Of this experience, Janet wrote, there was no anger between us, only cruel sorrow. After being received into the Roman Church, Janet went to Ireland, working with local people in and around Mount Aragal in County Donegal. There she also continued the country sports of riding and rowing and fishing, which she so enjoyed. Three years elapsed after her conversion before she came to terms with her vocation to religious life. The decisive moment was in May 1882. These are her words, and they're on that little card on your table. I was thinking of a religious life and saying to God, I should like it very much. But you see, it is impossible to think of it at present. And then and there, by my side, was a bed of blue hyacinths. And then the word of the Lord came to me. I saw it all. So I went to the convent chapel. There was a nun on a kneeler before the Blessed Sacrament. I asked God as a sign that if that word was from him, he would put me on the kneeler instead of the nun. <laughs> Almost immediately, the nun left her place and came to beg me to take it, yeah. saying she felt too ill to stay. Oh. I did not doubt further. <laughs> Even ever after, Janet thought of May 6th as Hyacinth Day, and each year quietly celebrated her call to religious life. Soon Father Galway arranged that Janet make an eight-day retreat at the Convent of the Sacred Heart, Roehampton, and he told the superior of the house, if Miss Stewart asks to be received into religious life, accept her at once. I have never before known such a complete person. Sure enough, on the seventh day of her retreat, Janet asked to be admitted to the society, and she was welcomed. It's a picture of Mother Mabel Digby. Janet began religious life at Roehampton in London in the fall of 1882. Thus began a long and somewhat mystifying relationship between Janet Erskine Stewart and Mother Mabel Digby which lasted nearly 30 years. <clears throat> Mother Digby was responsible for the novices when Janet entered the society. From the beginning, Mother Digby recognized the qualities of greatness in Janet and began to prepare her for leadership in the society, alternating between mentoring, motherly affection, and periods of hard trials and testing. Janet was continuously singled out, the fair-haired child, 
regularly separated from her contemporaries. She was mother's secretary, messenger, assistant, and even after her first vows, when she had heavy assignments in the school, this relationship continued. Mother Digby advanced Janet's preparation for final profession by two full years. And once professed, Janet was appointed to work with the novices herself, then became local superior, and then superior vicar in fairly rapid succession. Mother Digby had become an assistant general of the order in 1894 and superior general the following year. She asked Janet to accompany her on a visit to all the schools and centers of the Sacred Heart in North America between 1898 and May 1900. Janet to evaluate the schools and other ministries. Perhaps most inexplicable was Mother Digby's selection of Janet Stewart, rather than one of the or other of her assistants general, to visit Latin America as her delegate. In early 1901, Mother Digby sent Janet to make a visitation of the convents and ministries of the Sacred Heart in the Americas. For nine months, Janet was away from Roehampton, visiting Puerto Rico, Cuba, Panama, Chile, and Argentina. She faithfully recorded her impressions by letter to Mother Digby, and that's where we read evidence of her early cultural insensitivity. Her relationship with those she encountered also seemed oddly out of character, sometimes precipitous and harsh, as was more typical of Mabel Digby. Mother Digby called Janet my second self, Others called Janet a shadow of Mabel Digby. <laughs> Beyond their love of one another, these women, though, seem to have had little in common. Their correspondence, for example, includes almost nothing about the spiritual life or the intellectual life, both so precious and so central to Janet Stewart. Now, this was when the education of Catholic girls was going to be on the screen. <laughs> During these years, Janet Stewart is in her stride as a respected educator in the society and beyond. Her great contribution was her understanding of the psychology of human development. She was a realist and understood that not everybody responded to the same style of education, nor had the same capacities. What every child did have was a unique set of gifts and a mission which only she could fulfill. As Janet once said, we must bring home to our children, and to ourselves also, the responsibilities for our gifts. We must put our talents at interest and not bury them in the earth. And the reason is sufficient, that they are God's. Shortly after she died, it was written of her in the tablet, her understanding of children her widespread experience, and her realization of the sacredness of the trust that their care involves gave a wonderful strength and power to her teaching on education. Her little book, The Education of Catholic Girls, remains a classic in the field of education. On the death of Mother Digby in 1911, Janet Stewart was elected Superior General of the Order. She was not quite 54. She chose as a priority to understand and love each religious and each child under her care, providing the kind of work and projects that would bring out the very best in each one. On first becoming superior at Roehampton in 1894, Janet had said, I will try to make you very happy and her leadership of the society reflected that desire. The only way to govern is to love, she said. This is a woman's order and must be governed in a woman's way, by the heart, not by logic. The heart is the mainspring of a woman's government. 
Therefore, anything that takes us nearer to the heart of people is our great power. Unselfishness and love are our levers. Of the three years of her generalate, nearly two of them were spent in travel. Mother Stewart wanted to meet every religious and visit every work of the society. Only then could she engage in informed discernment and strategic planning. She spent her first year traveling throughout Europe. Then in 1913, Mother Stewart began her trip around the world. Here she is in the center of this little shipboard group. What is unclear in the handwriting on the photo is whether this was a trip to Antwerp or to Australia. <laughs> but no matter, it offers an image of her travels as Superior General. During this last voyage, she wrote her little book from the sea, The Society of the Sacred Heart, her last gift to us. The first copies were printed the day after her death. She returned from her world voyage filled with dreams and plans, but she was also exhausted as she completed her journey and returned to the mother house in Belgium. The First World War had broken out and the German army was marching into Brussels. Lest she be completely cut off from the rest of the society, Janet escaped to her beloved community in Roehampton, a perilous trip which only exacerbated her fatigue. Following an operation, blood poisoning went through her entire body, and there was no hope for recovery. Janet Erskine Stewart died on October, 24th, tw October 21st, 1914, just short of her 57th birthday. She had been Superior General for less than three years. And that's a picture of her coffin with the flowers around it. She was buried at Roehampton in the chapel she loved so much, in a vault at the foot of the altar, beside her dear friend, Mabel Digby. Thus far, we have considered the bare outline of Janet Stewart's life. I have offered you some facts, with here and there a dollop of embellishment. <laughs> These facts give us a skeleton a life in the context of a world, a church, a family, a vocational choice, a call to leadership, and an untimely death. In conclusion, I want to turn to a few truths about this woman. I call them truths because they ring true to me. They also represent aspects of Janet Stewart which endear her to me. I imagine your truths about her may be totally different because of what has drawn you to her. Perhaps during these coming days, we might exchange our truths with one another. Here are mine. Janet Stewart was uninterested in nothing, or so a tablet article said of her at the time of her death. That rings completely true to me. She had an innate curiosity, a brilliant imagination, a mind always welcoming the new and seeking the true. She was interested in farming, agriculture, and animal breeding, every bit as much as in scripture and philosophy and music. She was interested in psychology and the working of the human heart. And she was interested in discovering the ever better educational method though for sure she was a born educator. The wide range of her writings, both in subject and in literary form, is further evidence of her completely Catholic interests. Janet Stewart was a lover of words. Her writing and speaking were peppered with similes and metaphors and literary allusions often drawn from the natural world. She had a little twist or turn in a phrase which made the hearer pause and think. For example, we are all God's property and our life must be one wild bird song of praise, one wild flower's face looking up at him. Do not try to be a garden flower. 
<laughs> or tact is the perfect blending of the serpent and the dove. <laughs> you have to think about that one. Or on the subject of overwhelming thoughts in prayer, we might call them distractions. She said she could not reason with them any more than she could, quote, stop a runaway horse with a syllogism. <laughs> so much that she said was memorable. It was often humorous as well. For Janet Stewart had a deliciously keen sense of the ridiculous. A few examples. On letting go of pretense, she said, discard the lion's skin and let the donkey within bray handsomely. <laughs> Advice to a young teacher fearful of taking the study hall. When you face the school in the study hall, speak with as much assurance as if you were legislating for the whole of Europe. <laughs> to those reading beyond their capacity, you run the risk of becoming like overfed spaniels. <laughs> About a teacher after she visited her class, she gives answers to her own questions and then graciously accepts them. <laughs> Tone of correspondence. Letters should be joyous, not sermonettes on the four last things. I'm also very fond of the nickname she gave her secretary, the cadaver. <laughs> Though I'm not sure she ever called that to her face. This delightful sense of humor was hidden from many, though, because of my next truth. Janet Stewart was an intensely shy person. She had grown up, mostly by preference, roaming the countryside alone. And she referred more than once to my life of shy solitude. I suspect it sometimes took a supreme act of the will for her to go to the parlor to greet visitors, especially the affluent and well-educated. When an RSEJ was told she had visitors, Janet was heard to say, another Christian to the lions. <laughs> Once she asked herself, why is it easy to love nuns, children, the poor, and people with black skins, and why not grown-up white people of the world? Because of her leadership position, she was forced often to the fore. We might be inclined to say today that she was a socialized extrovert. But I'd like to believe that she overcame shyness not by socialization, but by grace. The shy among us can take some comfort in this triumph, probably rooted in her conviction that shyness, whatever else it is, quote, is not an apostolic virtue. <laughs> Janet was a great conversationalist. This may seem completely counterintuitive for a naturally shy person, but Janet worked at it. One of the secrets of her success was the well-chosen question. The way she conducted community recreation is a case in point. She believed recreation was precious time to stimulate reflection, not for mindless, superficial conversation. Quote, the community is too much intent on greater things to be fed on peanuts. So she would get the ball rolling. And here are a few representative conversation starters. Do you mind more having failed by omission or by deed? In other words, is it a greater reproach to you to say, why did I, or why didn't I? Or, what do you consider some of the minor joys of teaching? Or, state simply on what points you are imitable. <laughs> or, to what period of your life would you add six months? <laughs> Janet Stewart demanded intellectual rigor, both of herself and of those around her. Mental stagnation, she said, is a danger for us 
and it is very common. And another time she spoke of the, quote, untilled acres lying fallow in our minds. Such a wasted acreage, especially for educators. She was intent on training to the management of the mind and on the eradic eradication of defects of the intellectual life, especially vagueness, flightiness, and emptiness. The remedy for mental defects included reading carefully, thinking critically, formulating one's ideas accurately and without the prop of learning what others think, and most importantly, of regularly synthesizing one's thought. Janet Stewart was a miser of time, a mark, she said, of a mortified person. At some point in her early religious life, she made a decision never to waste time. And let's be clear, I mean not to waste any time. No matter what she was working on, she could write a few sentences between the exit of one visitor and the immediate entrance of the next. Though she was burdened with an immoderate amount of work, it was said of her that her competence, combined with speed in thought and action, enabled her to fulfill her obligations expeditiously. And the variety of her occupations gave scope to her remarkable powers. She communicated how priceless was the gift of time to her novices. One recalled, quote, she trained us to come prepared for spiritual direction so that precious time should not be lost in useless pauses and hesitations and the long explanations that come of not having previously disentangled one's thoughts. Further, this care for time extended to prayer. Give all stray moments to prayer, she said. Even if it should seem desirable to think out something, rather pray about it instead. And she considered holidays as precious time to remake your soul by taking deep breaths of prayer. Janet Stewart was a reader of the human heart. Once she wrote an essay entitled, The Harvest of a Quiet Eye. Her own eye harvests were abundant. One of her novices recalled, quote, how far the observant eye and loving interest of what I should call the naturalist was brought to bear upon us. Every line in the face, the curve of the lip, every shade of expression of countenance, the inflection of the voice, the precision of movement, the color and intensity of focus of the eye, the inclination or toss of the head, the articulation in speech, the pose of the hand, the tread of the foot, the bearing of the whole being, all of it revealed to her the spirit and mind and character within and gave her deep insight into the hearts of those around her. The better to discover their inner world and assist them to take hold of their own growth. Janet also initiated others as, as readers of the human heart. One religious told this story. Once when discussing someone with her whose strange ways I could not fathom, she said, Sister, study those shaggy eyebrows, the curve of that upper lip, the timid questioning of those eyes. It is the wild, shy nature of the seabird, but she carries within a heart as true as the rock on which she was bred. Finally, the last and most important of my truths. Janet Stewart was the quintessential personification of the Saint Savant. Madeline Sophie had hoped to instill both learning and virtue in those who engaged in the work of education. She looked for a combination of gifts she captured with the words Saint Savant, meaning holy scholars or learned saints. 
she urged a life of virtue so necessary to win the hearts of others. Cultivate gentleness, affection, and evenness, the fruit of patience, she said, together with that art and love of God, which I desire for you. But virtue alone was not enough. Sophie once decried the fact that the novice was filled with a lot of sands, but very few savants. <laughs> Scholarship and the rigorous training of the mind had to be joined to virtue. Who more than Janet Stewart embodied Sophie's desire for all of us? Janet believed the quality of the inner life of the educator determined to a great extent the quality of her teaching. She had an extraordinary ability to relate spiritual formation to the whole development of the person. And this gave originality and effectiveness both to her spiritual teaching and her educational philosophy. A book was published some years ago by Jean Leclerc, whose title describes the trajectory of Janet's life completely. The love of learning and the desire for God. What a perfect epitaph. Thank you.